so what I'd like to do in just a few short minutes uh, is introduce the National Digital Twin. Uh, so there's not going to be time to get into detail, uh, not right now. However, the day is quite a long day. So what I would uh, encourage is, um, is further conversation through, through the day. What I'm going to do is just scoot over the top of it uh, and try and address these questions. What is the National Digital Twin? Why do we want it? Uh, and, and what's being done to deliver it? Um, so starting off with a high-level definition of National Digital Twin uh, is that it's an ecosystem of connected digital twins. It's not one massive twin of everything. Uh, it's an ecosystem of connected twins. And I'll come back to try and explain a little bit of, uh, about what we mean on, on that. Um, another way of thinking about what the National Digital Twin is uh, is that it's a key part of fulfilling the vision for Digital Built Britain. And we've heard already about the fantastic foundation that's already been laid with the work that we've done on BIM. Uh, and that is incredibly important. Uh, without it, we wouldn't be able to imagine moving to, to further stages. But as we do look to the operation and maintenance of use of infrastructure, we can see that there's more to be done, that we can unlock value of information. And so the whole idea of using digital twins, I think particularly in operation, but not just in operation, broader than that, across the whole life cycle. That's a, that's a key thing, and we should definitely be encouraging the use of individual digital twins. Uh, as we'll see later when we hear some, I, uh, I, I know, fantastic examples uh, from Formula One and from, uh, from London, uh, that digital twins provide value. But what happens if we connect the digital twins, if we think beyond that and consider the integration uh, and what we can get by connecting twins together. So not just individual digital twins, but connected ones. Uh, and so that helpfully, I think, kind of maps out where this vision for digital built Britain can go. Building on the foundation of BIM, encouraging digital twins, and then facilitating the connection between twins. And the benefits are absolutely huge. I can't run through all of these. If you've read the Gemini Principles, you'll know that uh, the numbers potentially are enormous, like £7 billion a year. But it's not just financial benefits. Uh, we see benefits to society, across the economy, to businesses, potentially opening up a whole new market, and also benefits to the environment. So we know how important, for example, net zero is. But we can't move towards net zero unless we have a tool set that is competent to help us to manage across complex systems. And that's where digital twins and connected digital twins come in. And so the benefits are enormous, but I think what it really boils down to is it will drive better outcomes for the public per whole life pound. That's really what's driving all of this. That's the kind of the summation of the benefits. Uh, we see that uh, digital twins can help unlock greater value uh, from our infrastructure for the benefit of the people of the UK. And how are we going about delivering this? The, <coughs> the, the what's being done to deliver it point? Uh, one way that I think is useful to look at this uh, is the importance of working out what it is that we have to do and then getting it done. So it's a very simple model, which I think is at the heart of some of our thinking here. Uh, and so following Sarah's report, the Digital Framework Task Group was established to bring together government, academia and industry to help provide the alignment that we need to drive this huge national program. Uh, but the kind of people who are involved in the Digital Framework Task Group uh, don't actually own assets and can't make things happen. And so we really need the clients and the supply chains which are connected to clients to get the thing to work. So effectively, you've got a very simple model. On the right-hand side, the what should be done. On the left-hand side, how to get it done. And maybe that's at the, at the heart of uh, how we deliver it. But what I'd like to do is just loop very quickly back around uh, a little bit more detail of the delivery. So I've covered at a high level, what is it, why do we want it, uh, and what's being done to deliver it. But I'd like now to just dig under the skin uh, a little bit more and consider what it is that we're actually working on. And so if we consider the infrastructure that we have, um, it is a very complex mix of systems. So the transport system itself is not really one system, it's many systems which are interconnected. If we look at the energy system, that's becoming increasingly connected, uh, and more so as we see distributed systems. Water networks, again, huge, important systems. 
uh, and then telecoms, connecting it all up, uh, not to mention waste. And then we see also the social infrastructure um, of the hospitals and prisons and schools that are, are essential and connected into those uh, infrastructures that I've already mentioned. Uh, and then residential, commercial, and industrial buildings. And then behind it all, you know, within which it sits, uh, there's this massive interface with the natural environment. And if you put all of that together, what you end up with is a very complex system of systems that we already have. You know, we focus a lot on the new stuff that we build, and rightly so, because it's enormously important to the economy. Uh, but we have a system of systems already. And so I think in this vision that we are articulating or beginning to, to see more clearly, uh, we see it's important to recognize that system of systems, which is complex and connected. And therefore, we need a tool set which is competent uh, to help us um, run that system of systems. What we also see is that it's a system of services, because it's this infrastructure that provides the essential services on which society is founded. And we know that if infrastructure breaks down, then society breaks down very quickly. So the importance of the services are, are absolutely enormous. Uh, and that kind of gives us the purpose, you know, this system that provides the foundation that enables human flourishing. Uh, and so if we can improve it, then we can provide some, uh, some um, input uh, into improving people's lives. That kind of gives us purpose. We also see, though, that this system can become a cyber-physical system. Paul already mentioned uh, Industry 4.0. If we apply Industry 4.0 thinking to infrastructure, what we're effectively doing is making it into a cyber-physical system. And really, we need to recognize the importance of digital assets as well as physical assets and see that when we bring them together, we can unlock value. And then finally, we can reimagine this system of systems as a sustainable system I've already mentioned that we need to keep it going for society to keep going. Uh, but if it needs to be sustained, then it also needs to be sustainable. And at the moment, we don't run our infrastructure in a sustainable way. So as we drive towards net zero, as we start to consider uh, resource utilization, uh, then again, having competent tool set that will enable us to manage across complex systems is absolutely essential. So this is kind of why we need to have this concept, not just of digital twins, but connected digital twins. So, what is a digital twin? At heart, a digital twin is a physical representation, sorry, a digital representation of something physical. So in the built environment, that means a digital representation of assets, processes, and systems in, in our built environment. And I think the key thing that makes a twin a twin, rather than just a model, is this two-way connection where you've got a digital twin connected to the physical twin, doing something clever to generate insights to help facilitate better decisions that then feeds back uh, the interventions on the physical twin. Uh, and what you see built into that, kind of embodied in the concept of a digital twin, is this idea of an information value chain. What you can also see is it provides us a framework where lots of really important technology comes together. IoT, for taking data from the physical world and getting it into the digital. AI that helps us to make sense of that. Um, uh, augmented reality and virtual reality to help us visualize it so that we can make better decisions to get back into the physical twin. So, so this model, um, which I've just shown at a, a, a very simple level for a, an individual asset, um, can help us understand how it brings technology together for a purpose uh, and how it integrates that concept of an information value chain. Now, that's great for an individual digital twin. And like I said, we're going to hear some great examples later on um, of the value that's released from that. But what happens if we want to connect them? Because it makes sense that if we're getting this value out of individual digital twins, uh, that the data from one can have a useful input into another. So we wouldn't just be looking at a digital twin for individual trains or many trains, but also what about a digital twin for the signaling system, digital twin for the track, and then connecting those it has to make sense. Now, that's just within one sector, but we can take the same idea and maybe start connecting uh, between um, transport systems. And if we can do that, then we can think about connecting between different sectors. Now, that sounds all very nice and all very theoretical, but the thing is that where this matters is where it comes together. And where it comes together usually is in the context of a place. 
in the context of a city, because everything happens somewhere. Uh, and so when we see um, these different sectors overlapping and coming together, particularly in the context of cities, it becomes even more important to be able to integrate uh, across different sectors. And what is that integration all about? It's really about data sharing. And so if we look at the, the cell at the centre um, of a, the National Digital Twin, I've already said it's not one massive twin of everything. That would kind of be unmanageable. But if we can imagine it made up of many different cells which we can start to connect together, each cell of which makes sense to do, it's driven by purpose, uh, each cell of which is driven uh, by the organisations that want to deliver value, and yet we can connect them together, then you can imagine these connected digital twins. So that the, the, the whole concept of the National Digital Twin is driven by being able to make those data connections. It's all about secure, resilient data sharing. That's what we really have to facilitate, and that's what we're focusing on. It's enabling secure, resilient data sharing, and what enables that it's about consistency of data, enabling interoperability, and so that means we need to put some rules in place. Putting rules in place sounds kind of boring, but it's incredibly important to facilitate um, this thing that we see as being of immense value. So it's nice to talk about digital twins, national digital twin. Behind it, there is some serious hard work to do uh, to get our data fit for the national digital twin. And how are we doing that? Well, I think that there's um, a couple of ways of getting it badly wrong. Uh, at one extreme, if we came up with some kind of authoritarian top-down approach, put some experts in a room, get them to come up with a perfect answer, and then impose it on the industry, I can kind of almost see you squirming in your chairs. You know, that's not going to work, because, because we're not good at doing what we're told. Um, so top-down authoritarian approach wouldn't work. However, there is value in getting the experts together to see what really would be best. At uh, the other end of the extreme, Something else which wouldn't work is a fully bottom-up Darwinian-type model where we don't provide any kind of guidance, let everyone do their own thing, make it into a complete jungle, and just see which tree grows the tallest. The thing is, it's not necessarily the best tree that grows the tallest, and, and also a Darwinian approach takes a long time, and so it mu it's much better to give it guidance. However, the bottom-up approach of getting practitioners to learn by doing is also a good thing. So what we really want to do is bring them together and the way we're trying to do that is have the practitioners come together to share their learnings in the context of the DT Hub. Uh, Sam Chalton is going to uh, dig into that in more detail. But the essence of it is it's this collaborative learning community where those who own and are working on digital twins can come together to learn and share, but also to grow standards from their experience and to grow case studies. And then the commons which we're seeing as being this national resource which would be held in common that would unlock the kind of rules of consistency that we can all work to. And what we're trying to do is identify the very minimum that's needed at that top level to unlock the consistency to enable the, the data sharing. And what we're aware of is that we need to get on with this very quickly because we know that across the industry already people are developing digital twins and there's a danger that if, if everyone goes off and does it in their own way, uh, then we'll have all sorts of translation costs when we try to connect them. So it's really important that we get on with this uh, in a collaborative, um, aligned kind of way. And I see that one of the key things that what the CDBB is providing here, it's not control, it's much more about facilitating alignment so that we can get something that benefits us all and unlocks this thing of, of public good. Um, built around the Commons, the DT Hub, um, we have a, a number of other streams. They're described uh, in your tote bags. Uh, you've got a, um, a road map in there. So I won't go into the detail. Uh, it's just to say that we've developed around this um, a road map. We've got stream leads in place to help drive that. Uh, but this is a very open, collaborative um, uh, undertaking. And so we, we crave your involvement. Uh, so please do, uh, do kind of contact CDBB and, and get into it. But I, I know seeing around the room, there's an awful lot of people here who are already involved. So thank you. Just one uh, final thing on the, uh, on the Gemini principles. We see it as being really important that this is a values-driven thing uh, because uh, technology can be used for good or ill. It's, technology itself is kind of amoral, and we can see it in some places not being used too well, you know, in other places just being used for uh, individual gain. What we're aiming to do here is start with values which will guide us on the journey, uh, which can then hopefully fulfill the vision which is driven for us by Sarah's report, 
It's called data for the public good. What we're intending to do here is something that will be of benefit to people. So it has to be informed by, by values, and that's what the Gemini principles do. We're very glad that people are, uh, are buying into the Gemini principles. We still want feedback on it because we think they can get better. Uh, but for example, um, Matt Watchorn, who I see down, down here, uh, leading a, a really huge program in government, cabinet office, driving what's called the Digital National Asset Register, uh, that's signed up to uh, using the Gemini principles uh, to guide it on its way. Uh, and if you want to speak with Matt, uh, please do that um, during the day. So that was a very quick scoot through. Uh, I guess it's set up a number of questions that you might want to ask. Um, through the day, I'd be really happy to, uh, to engage and get into, into more detail. But thank you very much.